instruction is seldom of much efficacy except in those happy dispositions where it is almost superfluous, unnecessary. So already you must have completed 99% of the work and you come here just to cover 1% and then a resonance happens. But you know that you are actually speaking through me. That is not me speaking. Because this is your truth. Because you've got, the, because, uh, you've got to do so much of work by yourself. Then only you're getting it. No passive believing. No gullibility. Giving your life for it. And, and how do you begin? You begin with the boiling crisis. So that's why all the people in a boiling crisis, they are my bosom friends. Because for them a door is opening, if they want it. And uh, if they don't want it, then maybe they get some kind of a compromise solution and uh, then they resettle in artha and karma, partly damaged by hurts. And then you keep going as a traveler. So shall we now move on this journey, knowing that it's a very serious journey? Shall we move on forward? I have a question. Please. And I think that maybe half of us has it. Great. I didn't understand the statement you said. <laughs> yeah, I say it again. How did it start? Because the power of instruction. Uh -huh. you, you repeat it three times? Yeah. I repeat again. I repeat again. So now... What is the content of this statement? The content of this statement is about when does actually learning occur? Under what circumstances does learning actually occur? And what should be the preparation on the part of the disciple or the one who is seeking? So that there may be fulfillment and perfection in the learning. That's the content of that statement. Following the thing? So, under what conditions will there be fulfillment and perfection in the learning? And the student or the disciple just gets it completely, what a teacher is teaching. So, the power of instruction, instruction means teaching, the power of instruction is seldom of much efficacy. That means it is rarely of much power, except in those happy situations where the teaching itself is unnecessary. Got it? So that means you've done all the work. Just an atom or two are missing in the complete picture. Just one percent is missing in the total picture. And when your teacher is teaching you that, then because already you've covered 99 percent, just get it. So that's the kind of preparation or the hard work you've got to do. And that's the seeker. So in a sense, we may even say that the seeker actually does not need the teacher because he has covered most of the ground himself. He's struggling and struggling and struggling. And somewhere it's going to click for him and he passes the exam. And the seeking has to begin at a certain point in the spiritual life and the seeking has to get burnt out. It's got to come to a complete halt, the seeking. And then only you're finding because all seeking is an outward moment, going outward. And by going outward, you enter into the world of the senses, you enter into the world of thought and feeling. But Shiva is behind the whole thing, so how do you get to him by seeking? So initially, uh, you will run to hundreds of ashrams, hundreds of temples, hundreds of churches, hundreds of books, hundreds of satsangs, you will run everywhere. And then finally, you got to come back home. This is the ultimate home. So in Christianity, it is said that the kingdom of God is within you. And that has to become a personal truth for you. Otherwise, that religion has failed in the field of your life. This has to become your personal truth to such an extent that you will start talking this to others. That the kingdom of God is within you. That's the teaching I'm giving. But I'm teaching it now through a Hindu metaphor and through a Hindu Shastra called the Gita. But I'm essentially teaching the common denominator in all religions. There's a common denominator. 
the core and the essence of every religion, and that's what we're dealing with. And you may have the supposition that I don't know Sanskrit, and I want to tell you, it's unnecessary to know Sanskrit. Please understand this. <laughs> Some people may have a passion for languages, so they can study Sanskrit if they want, but it's not necessary. Even I do not know Sanskrit well. I've been struggling with Sanskrit from the year 1993. I've not got Siddhi in Sanskrit like, like I got Siddhi in astrology. I'm struggling still. It's like Sanskrit is like my beloved. I'm asking her to marry me. She's refusing. <laughs> I'm running behind her. She's not running behind me. So all people may not be able to get mastery in a new language. So that's not necessary at all. Get to the content of what is in the Gita. And there are, the Gita has been translated into 50 languages. And there are uh, more than 100 commentaries on the Gita, including by many Western scholars who studied the Gita in great depth. So you can take any scripture, go very deeply into it. I'm saying Christianity has the truth, Hinduism has the truth, and you've got to take a scripture to which you naturally feel attracted. You're completely at home in that scripture. Start working. Start working. But now I'm saying start working. But Artha and Kama may be so strong that uh, your involvement in this whole spiritual quest may be impeded by the pull of Maya. So that's why the ancients, they said, okay, if you want, you can struggle, but the real thing is happening after 60. <laughs> Your thinking is going to happen now, but the real thing is, uh, has much more, the whole season of life is more fertile for it to happen at that time. Because the, the, the pull of the senses, they've had their say in your life. You've enslaved yourself. We've all enslaved ourselves. They had their say, and it's over by 60. So we're going on that uh, path. So, uh, uh, Maggie Ji, is that uh, clear? Uh, yes, thank yeah, you very yeah, much. yeah. Which means, so what does it mean? It means you've got to do a lot of work yourself mm. as a student and as a learner got to work very hard. And uh, uh, it's not that you can be perfectly lazy and uh, somebody is going to distribute some free things and then you go there and you say, oh, you're giving it to me, I'm so happy I'm going to get it. No, you're not getting it, sorry. <laughs> That's just the beginning, you've got to work with it. You've got to work with it. And when in the oneness they say, all is grace, that is absolutely the truth. And the grace is coming from that unmanifest God. And got to understand the whole thing. Think about it deeply by yourself. Just as you're thinking in your professional life, thinking in your married life, the same kind of deep involvement must be there even here. That's the acid test that you are a seeker, that you are on the path. Not otherwise. So shall we move on now? Or any more questions? We're all ready? We are fresh like morning roses? Yes. Okay, good. So I uh, kind of brought forward the meditation at the end of part three uh, to a position in the middle of part three. So this is now over. So we move to uh, uh, fourth part, an understanding Atma Tattva, that is the nature of the imperceptible inner self. So let me go forward. Okay. This is now. This is. Uh, a seemingly, a seemingly difficult sutra. Remember, Sanskrit is unnecessary for this. Okay, the Sanskrit I'm just chanting just for me to get into the groove because I learned it that way. But the English thing is important. That's what you got to uh, hold in your consciousness. Now this is about. Now this is a thing. After this, I'm going to give a meditation for you to actually test it out in your life, so that you get the whole thing. Uh, now, this is about that prajna or intelligence. So, in the Hindu Shastras, it is said, Prajnanam Brahma. Brahma is that almighty, all merciful God. His very nature is intelligence because he designed the teeth. 
and he designed the genitals. He designed the galaxies and the atoms and the molecules and the DNA. So he has to be very, very intelligent. Where is the doubt about it? Just look at the intestines and you know that there's great intelligence behind it. So now, that intelligence when it is awakened in you because of the retirement of Shakti, Shakti has to retire, then that intelligence is awakened because Shiva then comes to the foreground and he shines. And what is that luster? That's the luster of bliss and intelligence. I showed a picture where Shiva has come to the foreground, he has come into full relief where he is lustrous. Previously he was dull and grey in the background. Then I showed you a picture where he has come to the foreground in full relief with luster. And that luster, what is that luster? That luster is silence, is peace, is understanding, is intelligence. So that intelligence shines. Now how does it actually shine? So Vyavasai Atmika Buddhihi Ekeha Kurunandana Bahushakahi Anantascha Buddhayo Vyavasayana Vyavasai Atmika Buddhihi Buddhihi is intelligence. Buddhi means intelligence. Vyavasai Atmika means this intelligence which is awakened it has got a capacity, a very natural capacity to stay with the thing without being distracted by one thought or another. That is, it's got a kind of uh, quality which is very laboring, which is untiring. It doesn't tire easily. So it's, it looks at one thing and then it can stay with it for quite a long time. Till the thing with which it is staying kinds of... Uh, uh, gives up the story to the intelligence and the intelligence grasps it. Getting it? Yes. You stay with it for a long enough time and then you receive it. And the intelligence receives it and you got it all. So this is a quality. So the quality of being able to stay with something and not uh, have the opposite quality which is wandering attention. Attention has no fixity to it. It's not able to stay with anything. It's constantly migrating from one thought to another, from one pleasure to another, constant vacillation. Because Shakti is inherently restless and she's chaos. She's disorder. And order is Shiva. Shiva is order, Shakti is disorder. Thought is disorder, when thought subsides, there is order. And Vyavasaya Atmika Buddhihi is the intelligence which has got the natural propensity or the gift, uh, which is more like a laboring thing. You call, your computer has a breakdown, and we call Sebastian G to repair it. Now, he comes and looks at the problem, and he's going on looking at the problem till he resolves it. There's no distractions. He's got no diversions. He's just paying attention. It's a very natural state. You're paying very careful attention. No thought is interfering. Till the whole thing, you make a diagnosis and then you resolve it. A state of undistracted attention, which is the opposite of wandering attention. Now, Bahushaka means many directions, in infinitely different directions. Those people who do not have this intelligence which has been awakened, their intelligence kind of attention, not intelligence, attention, is scattered in hundreds of different directions. So there are no fruits of that intelligence because there is a dispersion and a diffusion of that intelligence. There is a dispersion, there is a diffusion, there is a scatter of that intelligence. So that, that intelligence, because it's unable to stay with something very intimately, no learning occurs. So the intellect is not staying for a long enough time for learning to occur. It's probably staying for two seconds. And learning may commence only in the fourth second. So if you stay for two seconds, you're not getting anything. You've got to stay for four seconds. In the fifth second, something great may happen, an insight will come. But by then you are already distracted, so nothing happens. Following this? Yeah. So now please study this carefully. Study it and take it in.
Got it in? Great. So shall we move on now? Everybody got this? Great. I got to follow this picture closely now. Now this is wandering attention. Wandering attention. Never able to come to grips with any situation like this. This is what is. It can be a hurt. It can be a disappointment. A very painful situation a happening that happened in your consciousness and to your body. And this is another situation. Another what is. Another situation. And Vyavasya uh, Yatmika Buddhihi the understanding and discriminating aspect of consciousness which produces conviction when awareness is present enough to stay with what is. So what happens is you become intimate. There's a wrapping around. And then you perceive two entities in your consciousness. You're perceiving. You may see this form, your body. You may see your form. Then the person who hurt you the other, you may see that. For example, the red one is yourself. You see your form in that thought. That what is, is that hurt, a very painful moment. And then you perceive the other. Now, the perceiving source is Shiva. Because of Maya, the Maya, Shiva commits the fatal mistake because Shiva and Shakti are inseparable. Shakti veils Shiva to such an extent that Shiva, who is of the very nature of intelligence, of infinite intelligence, designer of the teeth and intestines, so that intelligence commits a fatal mistake. And then he identifies the red form as himself and the black form as the adversary in your life. You see two forms body forms you see, and that Shiva commits the fatal mistake. Now, the Hindu sages, they, they kept on studying the Shiva and the Shakti very deeply, very profoundly, because they were materialistically, they were not big achievers. Uh, so they dedicated their life for the study. And then they realized, then they realized that the primordial reality called Brahman, or God, or ultimate reality, or Shiva, that is actually two-faced, Janus-faced. So one face is actually Shiva, who is Satchitananda Parabrahma. In the Mola Mantra it's coming. Satchitananda Parabrahma is the pristine, pure state of Shiva. Sat is existence. Chit is awareness. Ananda is beatitude or bliss. And Parabrahma is unmanifest. is completely beyond anything that the mind and the senses can know. And because he's veiled by Shakti, an intellectual error happens. And he identifies himself. He forgets that he is the timeless observer. And then he identifies this body with himself. And then he identifies that black body with the, that of the adversary. So the duality between the self and the other is born. This is too much. <laughs> I'm always troubling you. So there is wandering attention and then there is attention which can become, which has the ability to just stay put. It's very, very watchful. It has no distraction. It's got no, vacil no vacillation of any kind. And then as it stays like that, then the nature of that what is, is revealed to it. Is revealed to it. But in the absence of staying with it, uh, without any motive, just staying with what is, not wishing to change it, not wishing to tamper it, not wishing to improve it, just staying with that. Then the what is gives up its story and the truth is revealed to you. The truth which is very different from the self-deception which you held to be the truth formerly. You had an impression that something is the truth and later you discover that that is self-deception and the real truth is revealed by becoming intimate with what is. And now, in the course of yesterday, there have been a number of examples 
where many of you, you have gotten into this wraparound and you were able to pay this attention, undistracted attention, as a result of which learning actually occurred yesterday. And learning also has occurred many times in your life. Many times. And you've got to understand the conditions under which this kind of a learning actually occurs. And the conditions under which learning is impeded because of wandering attention, the restlessness, the diffusion, and the dispersion of wandering thought, shakti. And so, now go back to your life. That's the meditation. Go back to your life and see if uh, there is a thing where you need to kind of get close to a, a situation which has got emotional charge, which is still, uh, the wounds are smarting, and that has to actually go. And, and uh, is there anything in consciousness which is calling for attention? There's a, a very sweet dog in Maggie G's house, and she's every now and then calling for attention. And the moment we cuddle her and talk to her, she's so satisfied, then she goes away. <laughs> so consciousness, it's calling for attention. And you've got to pay attention. Because it's called for. It's called for. So either, you know, go to a place where the attention is called for. You're being called to pay attention to that. Uh, be sensitive. Don't be indifferent and thick-skinned. Be sensitive and respond to that call for attention. Or look at examples in your life where spontaneously you have been able to stay with that what is, as a result of which the what is gave up its story, gave up its story, and what is just perished, finished, it's gone. Am I talking Greek? <laughs> no. <laughs> Spanish and English is going on. So shall we get into this? Yes. Happily? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for being so cooperative. <laughs> the chant will be going on in the background. The chant is just a kind of reminder to us that the ultimate life purpose is to go back home. And pleasure and pain are there in life. We got to pay attention to both, savor the pleasure, get intoxicated by the pleasure, and drink the pain as well. But then this is not the summum bonum of life. The summum bonum of life is to find the father and the mother, the eternal father, the eternal mother. And the chants are, place a repetitive emphasis on that home, on our eternal father and eternal mother. And we have got to do the meditation as the music is going on in the background. Cerrando sus ojos. 